Welcome to By the Numbers, Financial Models, Value Propositions, and Projections for the Next Generation of Hospital at Home Programs. It's a webinar sponsored by the Hospital at Home Users Group, pre presented in partnership with the American Academy of Home Care Medicine and the American Hospital Association. We'd like to recognize the generous support of the John A. Hartford Foundation for the Users Group and this webinar series. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Linda DeCherry, a member of the Hospital at Home Users Group Leadership Team. Dr. DeCherry joined Mount Sinai's Visiting Doctors Program after her fellowship and is currently the director of the program, which provides primary and palliative care for homebound patients in Manhattan. Today, and even more relevant to today's program, she is also clinical director of Mount Sinai's Hospitalization at Home Program and a national expert on hospital at home implementation and practice. Please take it away, Dr. DeCherry. Thank you so much. Um, so first I wanted to just uh, speak a little bit about the hospital at home users group, which um, hopefully everyone here already knows about since you're here at our webinar. Um, but um, this is a group of uh, people and programs that are interested in the hospital at home um, uh, principles. We have a website that's listed here. We have um, a Twitter handle. And most importantly, we have a technical assistance center. Um, and so if you go on to uh, that part of our website, you can find out lots of information about the hospital at home um, uh, model. One of the other things we do is have these webinars. Um, we've had a number of them um, over the last year. Here is a list of them. We have a few more coming up already um, in the works. Um, and we also have um, uh, office hours that you can join to ask your, your specific questions. Very importantly, we have our annual meeting coming up. It's on October 28th. Um, we will um, have uh, lots of great information, lots of great speakers. Um, so please sign up for that. And at the end, we're gonna have um, a slide that shows you know, where you can exactly um, sign up. So now I'm going to turn to our um, today's webinar. Uh, as we mentioned, the title is By the Numbers, Financial Models, Value Propositions, and Projections for the Next Generation of Hospital at Home Programs. Our speaker today is um, Tom Kesaw. He is the director with the Chartist Group and the leader of, the, of Chartist Digital, the firm's business unit dedicated to digital transformation, planning, and execution across the healthcare arena. Prior to assuming the leadership of Chartist Digital, he led the firm's strategy practice area. With more than 20 years of experience, Mr. Kisa has served as an advisor to many of the nation's leading children's hospitals, academic health centers, faculty practice groups, integrated health systems, and community hospitals. He directs consulting engagements in the areas of digital transformation, enterprise strategic planning, clinical partnership development, next generation service line growth strategy, and economic alignment. Mr. Kisa has also participated in the development of corporate strategy and product development strategy for multiple integrated business process and technology firms that serve the healthcare industry. So welcome, um, and we're very excited for today's presentation. Thank you, Linda. Uh, so hopefully the what you're seeing on your screen now represents what you saw in the uh, pre-wired agenda. Um, the questions that we're going to be talking about today are a lot of the key elements around how to actually do some of the financial modeling and, and organizational planning around a hospital at home program. So we'll talk specifically about four things, how to explicitly define the clinical population that you're going to scope, both at the launch of your program, how you can expand it over time, how to estimate the programmatic costs over a planning horizon of three to five years and how to think about the evolutionary rollout of the capabilities because not necessarily everything needs to be the capability you're gonna have down the line when you launch and you get to the minimum viable product. How to quantify near and long-term economic value creation. This is one that is really central to the benefits that Hospital at Home creates and how do you make sure that the organization understands and internalizes those because those benefits may not all accrue to your hospital at home program. So making sure the economic model is clear and the value creation is, is broadly understood. And then a couple of things we've learned from some of the work we've supported uh, in the domain on hospital at home and hospital at home planning is what are the common pitfalls, mistakes, uh, challenges you should expect 
when you're, you're planning for hospital at home. So we can go to the next slide and uh, hopefully this will align directly with those uh, key questions. So we'll talk about the, uh, the clinical path to scaling, how to invest, how to build the economic model, and then our perspective on what we've seen of those pitfalls. So we can dive into the next slide. So the opportunity, let's talk a little bit about this. This is a, an exercise we do with clients when we start talking about how they're thinking about hospital at home. So consider that if you were to build a new hospital in your health system, this would be, let's just say a 200 bed hospital. It would be a major strategic and leadership area of focus. You'd be outlaying capital on the area in, in the range of three, $400 million. It would be a cross-functional engaged process. It would have long-term dedicated support for years up to the actual program coming online. Yet, we click to the, the pivot point here, there's not a lot of care innovation, not to say there aren't new uh, considerations of building a hospital, but the care model is relatively consistent. And the financial model is really leveraging the one that we've all operated in for you know, the existence of health systems. You compare that to the other side here though, building a hospital at home program. This is a disruptive capability that has the potential to move as much as 20 to 30% of your traditional volume out of a hospital and into the home-based program. It's an entirely new care model with distributed delivery and coordination of clinical services that's unlike anything in a hospital. And it requires a totally new finance and financing and reimbursement mechanism. Yet, it's often not an area of major organizational focus or investment. And so in this context, what we wanna to try to highlight is try to help organizations get their arms around what hospital at home could be, what it will be, and how they can get the, the economic justification to be able to support the investment to build this entirely new site of care for their organization. This is looking at hospital at home. You know, there are a lot of uh, innovative ideas out there that there's really no clear evidential basis to say this is going to work. Hospital at home is not one of those. It's been around for a couple of decades in various deployments. A number of the leaders who run those programs are on the call today, part of the hospital at home users group. But it has enormous benefits in terms of patient results as far as uh, increased sleep time, reduced mortality rates, reduced adverse events and readmissions, lower overall cost, patient satisfaction with the experience themselves. It is something that is good for the patient, for the health system and for the healthcare ecosystem more broadly. The challenge is for health systems, we live in a world where this is in some ways cannibalistic to us. And so if we take it out of the health system, there's a, a lot of the focus we've seen with clients that have struggled. This is the implication of losing it out of the physical asset. But we have to look at this in the context of a broader market consideration. And there is a threat. If we as health systems aren't thinking about it, there are other disruptive players in the industry who are looking at it as well. Payers, home health agencies, technology vendors, retail health, physician practices, you know, non-local healthcare systems that see this as a way to extend their reach into a new competing pro a new competing uh, geography. All of these areas are sitting out here and hospital at home breaks down a lot of the traditional barriers that have protected hospitals from these kinds of existential and insurgent threats. But the flip side is it's not just a threat. It's also an opportunity. There's an opportunity, there's a cost arbitrage. There's the opportunity to, to, to capture new revenue. You can avoid capital expenditure. If your health system is full, you're thinking about the cost of adding new beds, you know, one to two to depending on your market, you can get into some of the, the West Coast earthquake retrofitting, you know, three, $4 million per bed. There's a lot of opportunity and justification to avoid having to invest in, in those hospital-based capabilities and to capitalize on what hospital at home brings. It's also something that a lot of the payers are interested in, and again, drives better health outcomes across all of the elements of ED interactions, readmissions, post-acute utilization. So it is a benefit potentially for health systems as well. But we need to think about the organizational elements, and it is a complex and new care model that we have to, to develop here. It's a business, not just a clinical offering, right? But you have to think about these five key dimensions that we'll spend a little bit of time on, but really in a macro sense, any of the planning has to consider the clinical model. How are you actually going to deliver the care in granular tactical detail? How are you gonna operate the business? All of the administrative support that goes around running this kind of a program that isn't directly related to the clinical elements. How are you gonna handle revenue cycle? How are you gonna handle all of the compliance and legal considerations? All those elements to operate this new site of care. What's your engagement model gonna be? This is not a patient locked in your hospital. This is a patient in their own home. How are you gonna engage the patient, their family, 
what is this, the technical platform that you're going to use to do that, as well as the processes and protocols that dictate how it's going to be operated? What's the economic model? This is the one that a lot of organizations have just said, there's no economic justification, so we're done. And the question is not, is there an economic model? The question is, can you make an economic model? And so what has to be true to be able to get the economics to work? And then the last one, what's the technical plan that undergirds all of those components to enable the organization to bring this capability to market and have high reliability, high service, and ultimately a scalable platform to be able to provide these types of capabilities. And then underlying that change management, culture, clinical engagement, operational readiness, this is complicated. It is at odds with the traditional elements of care delivery. And so we have to solve for those changes within the organization that are going to enable us to be successful. So the first place we have to start is how do we get the populations? Because there is a core chicken and an egg problem with hospital at home historically. The only way to get to economic viability in a hospital at home program is to get enough clinically appropriate scale into the program to be able to support the fixed costs on the right side that have to be in place 24 by seven to operate a hospital at home program. So the clinical and administrative oversight, the home-based care delivery options, the 24 by seven command center and the new hospital-based technical infrastructure that's good, the hospital technical infrastructure to be able to support the home that has to be stood up to make sure that things don't fall through the cracks and this is a high quality operation. The problem is, as we'll talk about here in a second, as you start to get to the populations that are economically directly accretive, those are quickly sucked up and, and there's not enough of those to support all those, those fixed elements. So you need to find new populations. The problem is for a lot of payers growing into the home care, into the hospital and home setting is actually cannibalizing the legacy inpatient revenues. And so at some point, the hospital at home side grows, the, the patient population grows, eventually your cannibalization bubble starts to grow too once you're out of the, the populations that are directly beneficial today. For example, those under the CMS waiver that it's a benefit and you can be reimbursed. So this fundamental challenge is what you have to solve for. But the first place to start is really thinking about how you're gonna create a value proposition that supports it and then build the clinical populations from that. This is a handy little uh, uh, equation that we use to think about how to justify the financial impact. This is the, the hypothesis that we've used with, with a number of clients of the value creation of your hospital and home program has to be greater than the incremental cost of building it and any cannibalized revenue loss associated with, with reimbursement reductions. So making sure that we're thinking about all the economic elements, but also the economic elements that may create benefits outside of the hospital and home program. And as you look down some of these points, reducing hospital OPEX, avoiding capital investments, you know, saving money on, case, on patients that are admitted to the hospital and maybe treated partially in the home, or being able to bring in additional cases by creating capacity, all of those economic benefits will be attributed to the hospital, not to the hospital at home program. The hospital at home program is creating the capability for the hospital to get those. And the point here is intentional. If you're only looking at your hospital at home economic unit, you are going to struggle to be able to ever justify the financial impact of the program. I'm sure a number of you have looked at this for your organizations or have, have done some, some quick analyses. How you get to the population that your program will actually capture is significantly more nuanced than just saying, here are the DRGs that are eligible. And there's multiple different DRG kind of listings that you could find, but it's more than just saying, here are the DRGs that are eligible and, and saying those will go. You know, there's a certain population of inpatient cases today that are coming into our hospitals. And there's a subset of those that based on a retrospective DRG analysis may be eligible for care in the home. Now the catch is it's easy for, for us business folks on the back end to look at it and say, this DRG is there, this patient could have been in the home, but it's more nuanced than that, right? Which goes to the next step down, which is what are the real time eligibility criteria for the patient that allows the clinician to be able to make the call to say, yes, they have a DRG that's eligible, and they're in a geography that we can serve, and their social determinants of health are appropriate for us to be able to put them in the home. And based on what I can see now with what's presenting to me in the emergency room or based on their, their uh, inpatient visit, what are the conditions that allow me to say they can safely go to the home? So the DRG is assigned retrospectively, we can look back. We need to be able to identify it prospectively. So how do we take that based on the symptoms and based on history to be able to identify it? 
And then now we've defined a, a clinical cohort, but now we have to figure out the ones that it's economically viable for the health system to serve. Today, that may be you know, the Medicare fee for uh, service uh, elements of the waiver. And then the next step down is we've now done several layers of, reduct of reductive cuts. Now we're down to cultural alignment. Is the patient willing to do it? Is the provider willing to do it? And is the organization uh, commitment there to do it? And so for each one of these, as you look to the right, being able to identify the path to scale. So for the acute population, thinking about who's going to be eligible in a macro sense, redirecting from uh, the ED into the hospital at home patient, uh, the hospital at home program, rebedding from an acute bed, bringing in future populations, observation cases, subacute, postacute, over time, potentially surgery cases that are that are recuperating in the home. Then going to how do you expand the population of the DRG cases, the, the DRGs you can bring in. So evolving your standards of care so you can take care of all a, a broader array of DRGs. The next one down, how do you identify these patients? The only way you get to scale and get as many patients through this funnel as possible is being able to identify them at the point of clinical service. So building out the ability and the infrastructure to be able to identify patients and present the idea and the option to the clinician making the decision. Next, economic alignment, it has to extend beyond your Medicare fee-for-service populations. How do you bring in other risk populations? How do you bring in Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, commercial populations, and get a bigger and bigger uh, pathway down the funnel of patients that are gonna be eligible? And then last but not least, and one of the areas we found to be one of the most significant as far as sensitivity to the outcome is treat your entire organization as a engaged buyer of this offering. They need to understand it. They need to understand what it is. They need to understand the importance of it long-term so that they can get behind it and support it. And if they're not engaged in the process, they will not. Interesting, what we found, patient willingness is generally pretty high, especially if the provider is advocating for it. Provider willingness is where we found a lot of the challenge of getting everybody on board with the idea, setting the standards on eligibility criteria with them, and then applying it. So I'm gonna move through these next pieces relatively quickly but it's gonna be a really important kind of framing piece that we're gonna go through to in a little bit of detail of the funnel. So the first point is understanding the populations you're talking about and being clear about that organizationally. There's principally two you'll hear talked about and, and that the waiver identifies specifically are substitutive care and restorative care, kind of the, the rebedding population. From, to apply and be eligible for the waiver, they have to come either through the ED or from an inpatient unit. So these are kind of the two core populations that, that many health systems will think about and pursue. But it's not the only population. On the next slide, we look at the ecosystem of home-based care extends much into the post-acute realm and then even upstream into the, the pre-acute. How do we start to think about some of the capabilities here to be able to get more populations to create more scale that the investments we put into the hospital at home program can be leveraged in, in other directions. And we'll come back and talk about this on the financial modeling too, because this is how we get the clinical population. It's also how we get the economic viability. This is an important piece to be really, really clear about with your organization. And this is a, we've tried to distill it and, and it's, I realize there's still a lot of words on here, but how do you think about in the ED redirect population, the best, the population that is really eligible for your hospital at home program? And we, we think about it in three kind of macro categories. Those that immediately fit, those that are based on all known available information, the patient looks like they can go into the program and be safely and effectively treated. Those that are we call delayed fit. Maybe there's some element of the clinical needs or clinical offering or social elements that the health system isn't ready to serve, but we see a path to be able to solve it in the relatively near future and there's an understanding of the population. Those two together tend to represent somewhere between 15 to 30% of the cases. The immediate and the delayed fit are the two that together kind of represent that overall DRG number, right? The, if all things being equal, what could possibly be in here? But then layering in some of the, the engagement around how to get the, the other criteria, whether it's social elements. And defining these are really important to have your stakeholders weighing in on. So what can go in today? Your emergency room attendings should be weighing in on that. Your hospitalists should be weighing in on that. Your, your medical staff in general should be having perspectives on each of these by understanding the offerings of the program and being able to stay where they fit. And we need to acknowledge there are some that just don't fit and won't fit for the near term. This non-fit population doesn't mean they won't fit indefinitely, 
But for now, there is a population of cases we're just gonna carve off and not worry about. The next piece is going into the rebed population. And this is, again, not, these are not in the ED, these are in inpatient beds being essentially transferred to a hospital at home bed. They still, by definition, are meeting inpatient criteria to be in, in a hospital bed. However, we're rebedding them to a lower cost of care and a more uh, patient-friendly setting, which is their home. And so being very specific and engaging the executive team, understanding the role of what this is gonna be and putting an orientation on why we will do it as opposed to why we won't do it. Engaging clinicians to get perspective on specific clinical conditions that would have a patient get in or be ruled out. And then the actual people on the floor, the operators who are gonna be making the decisions and presenting these ideas, how do we actually make sure that we've got a system that they understand and work this into their daily workflow so that we can be able to get the patients appropriately out that should be out. So when you start thinking about the eligibility criteria, the other piece here is being very specific on how you're going to theoretically identify the, the patients as they come through and putting the personnel resources or the system automation resources in place to support that process. This is obviously a very high level kind of illustrative journey for an ED redirect with a number of kind of steps along the way and, and uh, some of the granular details on the side of how you can leverage tools and how you can engage the, the ED clinicians around the decision-making. But this process is not something that you can create and then force on your clinicians. It needs to be something done with the clinicians that they need to weigh in on so that they can feel accountability for achieving some of the redirect numbers that will ultimately be tracked and managed throughout the work. And so as we think, so now we move into the economic alignment considerations. Again, the populations that are eligible are relatively limited today, right? It's any risk-based population where the provider bears the risk. Um, and if you're on the waiver, you can receive parity for the, fee, the ED redirect and the rebed population. But developing a very granular and specific set of considerations around how we are going to bring more payers into each one of these different payment schemas. Like what are the benefits of this payer moving into it and laying out a pathway to bring commercial payers, Medicaid, Medicare, you know, non fee for service, or if you're not on the waiver, how you're gonna get the waiver so you can bring these populations and looking at the implication of each one of those tranches to be able to quantify the impact on the overall population's economic viability. And this is a very kind of high level macro view. You have to be able to drill it down to the next level below this at the individual plan level, because obviously, especially at the commercial point, contracts vary dramatically by payer. And if you're not able to establish a plan for moving individual payers as part of this, you're gonna be stuck at a subscale point, which is you'll hear as you come to some of the conclusion points at the end, scale, lack of scale is what kills a hospital and home program. It needs to have the scale to be able to remain viable. And so making sure as many payers are in as possible and having a specific and targeted and actionable set of steps to get those payers, those payers in is essential. This is the point I was alluding to. The impact of culture. Sure, payer eligibility has an impact. You know, DRGs between delayed fit and immediate fit have an impact. But in our work, what we've found, the biggest variable is that the capture rate is the biggest driver of whether you can get enough volume into the program to make it sustainable. It's if you're not getting uh, patients or your, your caregivers to engage a patient, advocate for this and push, you can see a huge swing in your ADC projections. If you are, you can see a very positive swing. And so while all of these are important and, and all of these elements of the filter, are, you have to focus on and have a path to scale. The single biggest ultimately in, in the, the practical output tends to hit on the capture rate at the cultural adoption level. Again, the biggest factor there is the physician engagement and the physician participation in it to be able to support the program being used. So when you start thinking about the funnel, it's important to think about it as a sequential build. You don't need to launch and get to 50 patients uh, average daily census in your hospital at home program. So the launch condition is often gonna be isolated on your geographic reach, the hospitals that are gonna be involved within your system, the types of patients, the types of payers, 
and how you're going to resource and, and operate the business. But the key is being able to think to the next levels of investment to be able to get to those iterative steps and scale. So the initial one may be a small population of, you know, we are going to target to have 10 patients in our average daily census based on these assumptions. But the ability to build the storyline to say, here's the next tranche, here's how we roll it out to get it to something that is long-term viable. Um, to the question in the chat, the volume required for scale, it's a little bit of a, a loaded question, but we typically see it somewhere in the 15 to 20 average daily census, but there's also a big factor on it, it depends on the value drivers, things like your capacity constraints, that you, how you create the value that we'll come back to. In the interest of time, I know we wanted to make sure we had enough time for questions. I'm gonna jump into some of the, the uh, other elements of the, the equation, the incremental costs. So the first piece here, as we talked about value creation being greater than your loss on the economic side and the incremental cost of the program. And it's re really important to acknowledge these are incremental capabilities that many health systems will not have within their core operational offerings. They may have third parties that are providing them. They may have vendor partners, um, but there will be incremental cost to the program. And so we, on the next page, we just break that out at a, a very, very high level to represent it. The traditional inpatient model has you know, a bunch of direct OPEX, a bunch of indirect overhead, and obviously the capital asset is sitting there. In the new model, we've got new incremental direct expense. We've got new incremental indirect expense, and we have new capital expenditure to be able to support this. So this hits one of those economic holdups we see with health systems. We are not saving money on the traditional inpatient model. This, we still have to pay the same costs here on capital, and it's a very capital intensive experience. We're saving maybe a little bit on staffing if this hospital at home thing gets to scale, but there's all this incremental build on the hospital at home side. And while that, that economic holdup is a stark reality of the hospital viewpoint, the flip side is new entrants aren't encumbered by the traditional hospital assets that they have to offset. So if we don't solve for the hospital at home economic model, as others come in, they will just cannibalize our legacy business. And so we work through this in, in a little bit of detail, hit on the elements of the cost structure that need to be put in place. And it is a wide array of new services for many health systems that have to be integrated into the care delivery, as well as an investment in a number of centralized support services. Again, we've, we've generalized these and kind of aggregated them here around the command center and program management that are centrally built and centrally operated to be able to run a true hospital at home program. And so what the cost of each one of these though represents depends on how sophisticated you think about operationalizing them. This is one of the framings we find a lot of hospital at home programs are forced to stage one because they haven't had the investment from the health system to be able to push towards the stage two. So stage one is human mediated. We're depending on people, on manual process, and on you know, practically what it turns into is lots and lots of phone calls to be able to manage and administer the program. That's obviously relatively easy to start up, uh, less, less uh, time consuming, less costly, but it's unscalable because A, you've got risk of, of process failure and, and the, the very negative adverse events that come with it around quality and safety, but it's also economically way higher variable costs because you're having to cover all of the process with human steps. Moving to stage two is a system mediated model of hospital at home. Now this is where you're using technology and systems to help prompt and execute next steps around more efficient human intervention, but now you've got a fixed cost to be able to build the infrastructure, the technical components to be able to have the offering ahead of the patient volume. So now you have to be able to demonstrate an investment return because your costs are gonna be greater than your revenue streams for a foreseeable period of time. And then the third stage we call out is, if you believe in the home as a site of care, the lines that we've created through the traditional reimbursement systems will start to blur. And having capabilities to be able to serve the home will be able to be extended beyond just the individual hospital at home program to things like we said, some of the post-acute, but also home-based care models around primary care, home-based service lines for things like cancer, cardiac, neuro, mental health, that having these capabilities will enable us to expand our sites of care for our other programs and reach into the home differently. 
how do you actually practically start getting into some of these, these cost questions? Um, and, and I'll get to some of the, the pieces of the staffing costs and staffing ratios, because one of the pieces, if we go to the next slide, is understanding what you're going to insource, the left side, what you're going to outsource, the right side, and these are illustrative based on a, a couple of client examples. It's not to say this is the way everyone should do it, but then recognizing these are not static decisions. And one of the things we've seen a lot of health systems get stuck on, and, and uh, by trying to get to very discrete costs for insourcing, it gets into a lot of operationally detailed operational questions that sometimes distract away from the business planning at the high level, being able to understand what the overall pro forma for the program is, that you can actually just go to the market and see if you try to outsource you know, your, your respiratory therapy or, or certain functions within your program, how much would it cost to outsource it? Could you do it cheaper in-house in with your resources? Perhaps. However, you now have a market data point that allows you to plug it into your economic model that worst case scenario is kind of like your most conservative you know, bar that you can use that offering. Over time, maybe you outsource it to start and you move to in-source or maybe you keep it as an outsource. But what's really important in your, when you're estimating your cost drivers is how do you understand what your costs are on the in-source that are accurate and defensible? And then how do you actually understand what you're gonna use partners on in the house, on the other pieces? And so as you look at the unit economics, this is a, a de-identified uh, uh, illustrative example. Um, the start, you will likely spend more money in the human mediated model to be able to provide hospital and home services because you're still gonna have a very high um, human cost and you're gonna actually add more variable costs. You're gonna have incremental investment, but you're not actually gonna realize greater volume scale to be able to offset your, your fixed costs. And so as you start to look at your modeling and looking at your assumptions further out, the incremental fixed investments will allow you to shrink the allocation of that yellow bar, right? So the amount of money per interaction will go down and you'll be left with just a larger variable cost portion. And so this is, like I said, illustrative. It's not to suggest that you're gonna be able to make a windfall of money in the hospital at home program, but the relationship between variable costs and fixed costs as you bring things to scale and is it able to be leveraged with more volume will bring your variable costs down as well as your fixed allocations. So I'm gonna jump quickly into the value creation. I know we've only got a couple of minutes and I, I do wanna make sure we've got enough time. Um, value creation. This is where we're finding a lot of health systems are really struggling with how they're actually going to um, demonstrate a return on all those incremental investments and costs we just defined. And the premise for a virtual hospital is, is really predicated on, there's enough value on the left side of the teeter-totter here to offset the upfront pieces on the right. And the piece that we try to really be specific on, and if you look at a longer term financial plan is short term versus long term. And how can you bring enough investment in things like capital avoidance? Again, $2 million per hospital bed is a really big capital number that you can plan a lot of work against. And, and health systems have you know, cost of capital ratios they use to define what it would cost for that. That money is indefinitely saved. If you can keep it out of a fixed infrastructure asset like a bed, it can be deployed in perpetuity against the, the hospital and home program's operating costs. Reduced uh, length of stay, ancillary utilization. Again, if we can pull length of stay down, we're creating capacity in the hospitals. We're also able to pay, perform better on pay for performance uh, uh, contracts. May not be the focus of the health system today, but planning for it in the future and using those payer strategies as a way to finance the investment in this new site of care becomes a critical capability. Backfilling high acuity cases, if you're crowding out, if you're full of COVID cases that are relatively low acuity, you're not gonna be able to be doing your, your higher acuity cases and your, your ability to provide the care is compromised, revenue is compromised. So the more low acuity cases you can pull out and backfill with high acuity, Again, a benefit to the hospital enabled by the hospital at home program. And then again, the base case, there is, especially with the reimbursements currently in place, there is a direct revenue stream associated with this. So there is the practical consideration of incremental cash flow that you otherwise would not be able to capture. And so the piece we, we I have alluded to this several times is it's 
the hospital at home program is one, but thinking also about where you're gonna stack in other capabilities. This is just an illustrative list of some of the things that some of our clients have talked about trying to capitalize on the capabilities. But if you have a hospital at home program, you have 24 by seven remote patient monitoring capabilities, you have 24 by seven clinical command center offerings, and you have 24 by seven dispatch services. Thinking about different ways to leverage those offerings will drive down the cost of those offerings individually, making the hospital at home program more profitable, and will make other programs more differentiated and support growth and support value-based care models and other service lines and other offerings. And so it's not to say you need to build your financial model around every one of these, but considering these as part of the longer term strategic positioning of your organization can enable you to help offset that fixed upfront investment on the hospital at home program. And so just a couple of, on the next slide, you know, th things to do and, and the organization must that go with it. Um, several things that, that kind of have to be true, right? In order to get to the minimum viable scale, you have to culturally commit to an operating model across clinical and operational stakeholders to drive volume. This does not drive its own volume. And, and some, of, uh, some of the folks that I'm seeing some of the names that are here and some of our clients would attest, if you aren't actively managing this, the volumes will start to dip again. We need to drive a cultural change and reinforce a cultural change that this is an appropriate and effective care channel. You need to grow beyond Medicare fee-for-service. Um, this is a, a rapidly evolving world. I, I, for one of the comments earlier, you know, it varies by state for Medicare, Medicaid programs. Um, a number of commercial payers are looking at programs trying to pilot and test this. It is essential that the organization invest the time and effort to try to secure these kinds of contracts for more payers. Um, in order to reduce your inpatient costs, you've got to be able to actually get to enough scale at a given acute location that you can, you know, if you, if you reduce your average daily census by one or two, you're not closing a unit. So there are step functions of value that have to be reached to be able to drive the economic benefit. Um, to be able to reduce your future capital outlay on bricks and mortar, you have to be able to do, commit to the ability to move the needle on your, your hospital at home program far enough in advance to impact facility planning. As we know from my, my cliche in the very beginning, that is a huge window of planning. And so the sooner you can do this, you can help avoid you know, five, 10 year capital planning windows for future facility improvements, retrofits for new bed build. Um, in order to realize cost savings at case rate reimbursement, Looking at care model efficiencies that reduce answer utilization, reduce length of stay, we, we have to be thinking about how we can leverage things like alternate care settings like the home to be able to reduce the overall cost and create new capacity in for what our many health systems are a constrained asset, which is their hospital. And then in order to realize the full benefit of the infrastructure investments, we need to be able to build, we need to build business cases and look beyond just the hospital at home look at all of the other applications of care in the home setting so we can make sure we're, we're able to realize the benefit. If you're gonna do a hospital at home, these are the bumps you should expect. You should expect people to resist this. They're not bad people. They're not against the idea. They are learning a new model in a new environment. And we've all been, we're all creatures of habit. We need to support them. Implementation and integration challenges, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be messy. There will be bumps in the road on technology, equipment, mundane things like how you're handling equipment sanitation, stolen equipment that you're gonna to have to solve. Those are bumps that can be overcome. And they're not huge economic burdens. They're just things you have to manage through. Patient privacy and network security issues. You're opening up a whole new element of your data uh, platform into patients' homes. Now you can provide the devices, you can provide certain levels of security. Are you gonna have a camera in a patient's home? You have a, you have a whole different set of considerations. Again, bumps not things you can't get over. The data is not fully interoperable yet and being able to hand off data between different systems is gonna be a challenge. Um, again, solvable problems, maybe your MVP versus your long-term, you're gonna have more manual interfacing versus long-term uh, electronic data interfaces. And then the last one, the lack of infrastructure and supply chain to support care delivery in the home means you will probably have to look to partners. Don't expect that your system has to do everything. This is a completely new capability for most health systems. And so it's expected you're gonna to have to look to partnerships, but they may not be permanent partnerships. They may be initial to help you get the program launched, but those are kind of the common bumps. And I like to 
convey the bumps versus the pitfalls. And I'll, I'll move through these quickly, the last slide really here in, in kind of the, the core content. There are four big pitfalls that most organizations uh, that, that kind of get stuck on us blow to home hit. The first one is a lack of organizational and leadership buy-in. And when you see that, you don't get enough resource investment and there's not enough of an organizational mandate behind the hospital at home program or leaders of the program to get answers to questions they need answered to be able to support launch. And so you, you often find subscale programs or a sub acute hospital at home program that can kind of build um, iteratively off of like the home care infrastructure, but not really getting to replacement and, and a strategic positioning to obviate acute care for abortion. The other pitfall we see is just a lack of sufficient financial and human capital investment. Um, this is an intensive effort. It takes scale to be able to get the benefits and it takes resources to be able to shepherd the change management and the process through the organization. If this gets dropped on someone as a side of their desk effort and they don't have resources to support them, it will not in, in almost any case be able to get to the scale of a full high functioning hospital and home program, just like you wouldn't expect any other new business to launch off the side of someone's desk. The third pitfall is not clear on what the hospital and home program is trying to achieve. Um, if you're not gonna say what success looks like, look, success looks like, it is practically unachievable. And therefore you're never gonna be able to get the investment to support the next capabilities and those step functions. And so you often find these programs getting stuck in human mediated. It's an interesting experiment, it's an interesting pilot, does some kind of interesting stuff but it doesn't meet the threshold for differentiation and scale long-term, and so it sits there. And then the last one is a lack of clearly defined financial benefits. And I know, you know, in a short time, we quickly gloss through these, but there are a lot of economic benefits that a hospital at home program can create. But in traditional financial accounting mechanisms, it often looks like a lost leader, which makes it hard to justify the incremental investment, despite creating benefit for other PNLs. And like the example I said, the hospital realizing the benefit. These pitfalls, any of these can be things that they're not bumps in the road. They are a, a bridge missing on the path for hospital at home. And if you don't solve these and don't acknowledge the implications, or if you're seeing these implications, the pushback would be, is this the pitfall you're stuck in right now? These are the things that most hospital at home programs are facing that are causing them to struggle to get to the necessary scale to be able to show the economic return. So, I, I uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go to the next slide, kick it back over to uh, Linda and uh, try to answer any questions. Sorry for going a few minutes over, Linda. Oh, no, that was perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think you gave us a lot of great information. Um, we do have quite a few questions. So I'm going to start with the Q&A. We have a question about, um, can you share financial arrangements for the inpatient early discharge patients given the DRG? Yeah. So, so the models that the model that you're looking at, I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand. Can you share the financials? Are they asking uh, Christine? I'm not sure if you're asking if you can share the money back, um, or if you're the, you're asking me the models we've put in place. We've looked at this very specifically on a unit cost mechanism, um, and so being able. This is where I was saying, here are the 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 days of staff beds that we have to use if we can cut a day off the length of stay and you aggregate that across a macro population, how many days can you reduce? And then quantifying that based on those variable costs. Oh, and you're getting a clarification. Yes, yeah. So you're, you're adding in, you're essentially arbitrage, there's an arbitrage here, right? The cost of hospital-based care versus the hospital at home-based care, there is a difference. The hospital at home-based care is in fully allocated less. And so if you can pull that patient out, put them in the hospital at home bed, you're able to conceivably either reduce your staffing in your acute unit or backfill that with another patient, another case rate, and you get another full case rate payment that otherwise you wouldn't have been able to accept. And so there's two pieces here. If you have a capacity issue, you will double win, right? Because you're gonna able to, you're able to save on the cost and the case rate, even though you've got the incremental payment to the, to the hospital at home or the incremental cost, but you're also generating more revenue per bed, right? So Again, this is where I think when someone had asked, the value, the minimum economic scale really depends on a couple of variables. Capacity is one. If you are at capacity, your threshold for being able to get to that minimum economics, the minimum size is dramatically lower than if you don't have a capacity issue. Having said that, you don't need to have a capacity issue for this to still be a strategically viable play 
it just may have a longer upfront investment window to be able to get to those, those other populations. Um, we have a couple questions here. I'm, I'm switching to the chat for a minute now about how do you evaluate staffing costs? Do you have staffing ratios? And kind of a similar question is what happens when you cannot insource nursing because you don't have a home health license? I think they're both related to staffing. Yeah, so there are there are definitely staffing ratios. I think one of the things, and, and not to uh, inappropriately plug, but since you're sponsoring it, the user group is a great source to get data points on staffing ratios. It's a great cohort of people that share a lot of really good information on this. Having said that, the models vary pretty dramatically, and it really depends on a number of assumptions about how you're serving, which clinical populations you're, you're serving, and how you're serving them. You know, whether it's and the role of other support resources, community paramedics. The role of virtual. How, there's a there's a number of variables there that would make the exact ratios vary, but the ratios and those models we would recommend building those with your clinical teams at your organization, talking about it, discussing it, understanding you know if if there's you know union concerns with different sites of care, maybe you avoid certain models. If there's third parties that you work with that can provide the capability that you can't. It's a little bit the answer is going to vary based on your specific considerations, because this is, you know, if you're trying to do this purely with just nursing, for example, I'm sure you're all dealing with the same challenge most of our clients are, which is there is a pretty acute issue going on right now with just nursing staffing in general. So trying to be creative about how you can meet the conditions of participation, but still provide service in a way that isn't 100% predicated on the most constrained resources in our healthcare delivery system is where you want to bring in your clinical partners and obviously engaging payers and, and you know, the, the user group for, for other experiences. It, it, it's just a, you've seen one, you've seen one, I think is what we've experienced. A question here in the Q&A is, can you address how academic medical centers can get excited about hospital at home and can be willing to crack the inpatient mold and training of residents? Uh, maybe a little bit out of your um, area, but I'm sure you work with um, academic medical centers. Yeah, you know, we work with lots of academic medical centers and, and I will uh, generalize and say, I think the residents and the trainees in general, the, the fellows and residents are often excited to be able to be a part of new and innovative models. We've seen them in a number of our clients actually pushing to say, why isn't digital care delivery part of our curriculum? Why aren't we think, talking about this more? Why isn't it integrated into our teaching experience in the same way? I think you would find that they are often willing, they're probably the ones most pushing to break the mold. Um, I think it's incumbent on us as you know, the, those who have been in the industry longer to figure out ways to test how we can break the mold. I mean, there are certain elements of the, the training programs that they're not really built for flexibility. So how can we give them some of these exposures and these experiences and use it even as a way to differentiate the training programs to say, it's, you're going to have a traditional training, but you're also going to have some of these new capabilities, such as rounding with the hospitalists in the hospital at home program. Great, yeah, I, I definitely agree. We've had a lot of excitement from our trainees. Um, there's a question here about how do you get payers other than CMS to agree to this payment model? Yeah, so this is when we've done a fair amount of, of back and forth modeling with some clients on. Um, you need to actually go to them. I think one of the pieces we've seen is a resistance from, from finance departments and the managed care team to go to payers to talk to them about new payment models and things like hospital at home. And there's a little bit of a belief in, in some circles that we've interacted with with clients that if we go and ask for this, we're gonna have to give them something, right? We're asking for them to do something different. So therefore they're gonna take it out of our hide on our overall fee for service rate growth. And this is not to suggest that every payer is gonna be tripping over themselves to do this, but a lot are. And a lot of the major payers are looking at doing these in partnerships that don't involve hospitals, right? They're looking at other partners, they're making investments in policy groups to be able to support care in the home. We need to be the ones going to them with the solution that is mutually beneficial. Again, I, I'm not saying that that means they will say, yes, we'll do it, but we have found when you give them an offer that shows them how they can save money, and we built, we didn't have it in this slide, we built a slide where we show the waterfall, we bake in a discount and showing them that we can give you a better patient experience. We can keep your patients home. We can avoid readmissions. Patients and your members will be happier. And we can save you 15% on your admission. 
they are willing to listen, but you have to give them something to react to instead of saying, how do you feel about hospital at home and expecting them to figure it out. I also think CMS has kind of given them a little bit of a kick here. I think we're seeing them be a little bit more uh, open to talking about it. And I think that the, what happens post public health emergency will be, if, if provided the home hospital home program continues in some capacity, I think you will see more and more commercial payers really believing this is gonna stick and, and making investments in the program. Great, thank you. There are so many great questions here and I know we're not gonna be able to get to them all. Um, and you know, we have a few last slides here I wanna get to. What we'll do is we're gonna share them with, with Tom and you know, if they're appropriate he'll, you know, for him to be able to answer, he'll answer them or we'll maybe as um, the users group, we will get them answered and um, uh, you know, put on our website or responded to you. Um, so I'm going to move on to the, the last couple slides here. So again, this was sponsored by the Hospital at Home Users Group. Our website is on here along with that technical assistance center um, that we mentioned. Um, and if you're specifically interested in the CMS waiver, we have a lot of um, good notes um, on that on, on this last website listed on this slide. Um, again, these are our webinars. They're all available, just like this one will be available online soon. Um, so you could spend your Saturday night binge watching all of them back to back. They're that, that, they're that engaging. Um, and um, we have, um, as I said, the, the conference, our annual meeting is coming up. Please register. There is a small fee, but it is going to be a fabulous conference. So please join us on October 28th from 11 to 5 p.m. Um, it's a virtual conference. So um, thank you very much uh, for the presentation today. And again, thank you to the John A. Hartford Foundation who supports the users group. And this um, webinar was put together in conjunction with the American Academy of Home Care Medicine and the American Hospital Association. Thank you.